Yeah, so I, I came here today to talk about the throwing shoulder. This beautiful day. Um, <laughs> so hopefully it's a nice day and you don't feel bad about being here. Um, the shoulder is, is, is a very interesting joint and as much as I'm going to talk here today, it, it's probably one of the uh, less well understood joints that, that we have to deal with, um, especially in, in the throwing athlete. Um, there's so many things that are going on there. It's a, it's a joint that has a, a significant amount of range of motion and that range of motion is um, very important in being able to throw a ball hard and fast. But at the same time, when you start to have either increases in the range of motion or decreases in the range of motion, it's hard to determine what's normal and what's normal for any given person. So that being said, it's, it's, it's a very interesting joint. Um, and hopefully this will be a good, good talk and you'll enjoy it. So I, I also am going to take time to talk a little bit today. How many people in here, just to get an idea of the audience, who's like an athletic trainer? And then like therapist? OK. Any coaches? Mm -hmm. OK. So, uh, well, OK. Well, anyway. So I, I mean, the, the, the main <coughs> gist of the talk here is that most of the injuries that we see, especially in throwing athletes, are overuse injuries. So the STOP program, something that uh, Jimmy Andrew had started a while ago, I'm basically looking at um, the amount of throwing and other activities that, that youths do nowadays that, that cause overuse injuries. So these are injuries that happen and, um, because of repetitive activity and that can, can hopefully be avoided. So here's my plug and I'll, I'll plug a little bit more as we, as we keep going on about not throwing too much too early. Uh, just a little brief outline of the talk, a little introduction, talk a little bit about epidemiology of the injury, a little bit of uh, anatomy, talk a little bit about biomechanics, injury and treatment. So the main gist of the talk here is you know, we can talk, we're, we'll talk about injuries, we'll talk about um, what it takes to be a, a, a good pitcher and, and that's, that's really the goal is because every kid who's playing Little League Baseball right now is, is hoping to uh, make it one day and, and it, the question is, is what does it take to throw a 90 mile an hour fastball. That's Josh Fields, he played for Georgia, I believe. And you can see here that it takes a tremendous amount of uh, force to throw the ball 90 miles an hour. He actually has a pretty good delivery in, in that it's not too um, complex, but that being said, he's also, he's also sort of a max effort pitcher, so he puts all of it, everything into it. The next person I want to show is Tim Lincecum, who has lost something over the course of the last couple of years. And he has a nickname, he's known as, as the Freak because of the amount, if you can see the way that he can contort his body. So this has a couple of advantages. One is it hides the ball so that batter can't see it until the end. The other thing is he, he generates a tremendous amount of torque and velocity as he's, as he's throwing the ball. And that starts all the way down from his legs the way that he, he turns his trunk when he throws, and the way he brings his arm back. And all of these things have to do with, with how hard you can throw a ball. So as much as this talk is about, say, the throwing shoulder, uh, throwing is not an activity that's centered in your shoulder. The whole, the whole process is, it comes throughout your, your entire body. And, and one of the ways that people describe this is they say that you have a kinetic chain. So, you take the energy that you, you develop in your legs, you bring it up through your trunk, through your back, and then basically take all that energy, take it through your shoulder, through your elbow, and then as you, as you release the ball. And then this is one of our pitchers who really is a very low effort pitcher and can throw the ball 95 miles an hour. So a little bit of shoulder anatomy. When, when we talk about, when I explain things to patients and, and stuff, if you look at the shoulder here, there are basically three parts here. So here's your AC joint. If you get a shoulder separation, that's the part that, that separates. There's a part, if you can imagine, the rotator cuff comes across here. This is the shoulder joint itself, so it's called the glenohumeral joint. It's surrounded by a soft tissue sleeve or, or kind of like a balloon. It's kind of like the skin of the joint. That's the capsule. 
And the capsule has some thickenings in it which help provide stability. And then above the rotator cuff, that's, this is your subacromial space um, here. The, the shoulder's an amazing joint. And I, don't, I can remember the first time when I was a resident where you, you first start to realize this, but your, your shoulder's really only connected to your body here. The small little joint that's about the size of my thumb. So, you know, if you, if you do, if you take somebody's arm off for whatever reason, it's one bony cut, it's one cut here. So, and the advantage is, is that you can, you can do all these crazy things with your arm. So you can move it all over the place and you can throw a ball and I, even though God didn't design us to throw balls, that's what we can do. And that's in a little bit, uh, it's not the opposite of the hip, but it's a little different than the hip. And Dr. Cassio will talk about this more later. But the hip, you can see, is a little more constrained. So you have bone that surrounds the hip joint almost the whole way around. And you do have a lot of degrees of freedom here, but it, um, you know, the injuries you get are, are more of like kind of, uh, they're similar in a way that they're pinching, but it, again, it's because you have a little bit more constraint there. One of the other interesting things that we talk about is in throwing athletes is, is that these bones, and it happens in the hip too, um, they, they're smart, you know, I, I think, God created us for a reason and they create us in a certain way and, and our body responds to, to what we're doing. So a throwing athlete, they're, they're, the way that their bones develop and grow is, is different than somebody who doesn't throw. So when you're, when you're born, this bone is, is what's called 90 degrees retroverted. So it's, I don't want to say it's pointed backwards, but it's pointed backwards. And over <laughs> <laughs> so as you get older, it, it slowly starts to come forward and it doesn't, go, it doesn't go all the way, it stops at about 30 degrees. But in kids who start throwing in Little League, it actually slows that. So this bone doesn't turn all the way forward. It actually stops maybe 15, on average, about 15 degrees from the front. At the same time, this here, the glenoid, um, that's pointed a little bit back too. And, and in throwing athletes, the same thing. So they have what's called retroversion. So again, it's pointed towards the back. It, it doesn't go as much towards the front because what's happening is the body's responding to re repetitively doing this. So to throw the ball hard, the, the more external rotation you have, the more, the more you can do this with your arm, uh, the more force that you can generate. So as you keep doing this and this and this over time, your body says, hey, you know what? You know, whether it be Derek or, or Brett or whoever else, they're like, you know, Derek wants to do this. Let's let him do this more. So over time, throwers get more external rotation and that's more of a, a adaptive phenomenon. The question is, and we'll talk about later, is when these adaptations that your body makes uh, actually become pathologic or, or a problem. Um, at the same time, we, we have to remember that the, the scapula, so the scapula is attached by that one bone here, but <coughs> it's also attached by all these muscles that, I, that help turn it. So it has the ability to turn, which, which actually is almost a third of, of your ability to do this. So, you know, two thirds of it's in the shoulder itself, but a third of your ability to do this comes from this bone turning and allowing the, uh, the bone to turn on top of it. So here. So it's been, I've heard this described as, I, I like to tell people that it's a golf ball that sits on a tee. I have another friend who says that this is kind of a it's like a seal. So this is a seal that holds a, a ball on its nose as it goes up. So again, getting back to the glenohumeral joint, there's not a lot of stability here. So this picture, I, on, I did this on purpose. I, I left the, the ligaments and stuff out. There's not much here that holds this golf ball on the tee. You have a thing that's called the labrum. So it's, it's a little bit extra cartilage that goes around the rim that helps keep it in place. And then the, uh, the capsule, again, the skin that goes around the joint helps keep it in place by itself. These are some of the, what are called static stabilizers, or things that just keep the shoulder stable by doing nothing. At the same time, you have what are called dynamic stabilizers, and those are the muscles. So that's your rotator cuff, and then your biceps tend, or one of your, part of your biceps comes up in here and attaches to the labrum too. So this is your rotator cuff. 
Um, I like to think of it, you've got one in the front, one and a half on the top, and then one and a half in the back. So here's your supraspinatus, your infraspinatus, and teres, and then the front is a subscap. And the job of the rotator cuff is to take that ball and make sure that the ball is centered on the head at all times. So as you, as you start to lose that kind of force couple and the ball starts to move around on the, on the glenoid, it, you, you start to um, lose a couple things. One is the, the force that the muscles are allowed that are able to generate decreases. So they're, they're not, because the muscle's not at the correct tension, they don't work as well. So that's a problem. The other thing that can happen is it starts to pinch things that are on the, on the inside. So it can pinch, so if you get a little laxity in the cuff, it can pinch the cuff or it can pinch the, pinch the labrum. And as these things happen time and time again, so again, it, just to get the idea that, that throwers have overuse injuries, as they say happen over and over and over again, that's how you start to have a problem. Uh, and then I'm, I'm going to circle around back to throwing is, and your shoulder is inherent. Uh, there's a lot of other muscles besides the rotator cuff that have a lot to do with it. So again, here are your scapular stabilizers. So they help turn, the, turn your scapula and they will react in kind to what's going on in the shoulder. So oftentimes, if you have problems inside the shoulder, that'll be reflected in the way that these muscles work because they'll start to, they'll start to try to fix the problem in the shoulder. And and you, you'll start to see differences in the way that the, the scapulas align. Uh, there are a number of muscles in the front, so pec major, the pec minor I left off on there too, but the pec minor actually has a lot to do with the way the scapula moves. And a, a lot of pitchers will have tightness in their pec minor and that'll protract their shoulder and, and tilt it anteriorly. Um, the latissimus and then the deltoid. Uh, I'm gonna pause for a moment because one of the residents bet me that I couldn't get I don't even know how this started, but we were talking about the ESPN body issue, and she said that she was going to try to, they, they're giving their graduation talks today, that's why I have to run it, but um, she was going to try to, she would work in one of, one of uh, a female ESPN body picture, if I would, so that's hers, and then I, I tried to make mine at least kind of funny, so. <laughs> this is Matt Harvey, I, I actually was born in New York, so I'm, I, shh. Um, so, uh, I don't know if, if everyone who follows baseball, Matt Harvey's a great pitcher. He's just coming back from Tommy John surgery. And, uh, you know, I, I, I use this picture just to demonstrate how much is going on in, in a pitcher's body. And I, I put on all these little things because, you know, we're here talking about the shoulder and when everybody talks about throwers, they talk about their shoulders. But when you, when you deal with these athletes, the, the whole, you know, it takes the whole thing to be able to, th to throw the ball. So I, 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 last night we were at dinner, we were talking about, um, you know, one of the things that I do for the team is that I go through the medical records of 300 athletes of like prospects. And uh, when you look at the pitchers, they get injuries everywhere and it, and it all has to do with this kinetic chain. So it all has to do with the ability to take the ball, take the energy from the ground and throw the ball. And so you see people with chronic hamstring problems, proximal hamstring problems. Pars defects are actually pretty common in pitchers. Oblique strains are becoming more and more common. And I think these kind of problems are, are interesting. It's a different kind of talk. Um, athletes are becoming, especially collegiate athletes and high level high school athletes are becoming more and more cognizant of, of how important it is to have a strong core um, in being able to do basically any athletic activity, but being able to generate force to throw a ball or hit a ball. So we're seeing more and more oblique injuries over the course of the past 10 years. But this is all important. And then of course, when it comes to throwing your shoulder and then your elbow. So just to go a little bit about pitching, if I, if I use some of these terms and just so you know. So pitching is, has been split up basically into five, depending on how you define this, or four. Um, stages. The, the wind-up is kind of the, the first beginning stage and typically people don't have problems or pain with this. Early cockings as you start to bring your arm back. Late cocking is, is basically as you bring your arm back and then when you, the pause when, you, when the 
energy starts to change. So when you take everything that you've brought up and then you're bringing it all forward. So that's maximal external rotation. So that's when you've, you've reached the top. And then you bring it all down and basically your arm's accelerating and then you follow through. And over the course of this, you can imagine the inside of your shoulder sees different things. So like as you're cocking, that ball's trying to push itself out the front, so that can cause problems. It's also pushing back, which causes a different kind of problem. As you start to accelerate, your, your body's almost um, trying, and you're not trying to, but you're, you're, you're functionally almost throwing your arm out of your socket. So you're, you're, your body's trying to keep that from happening. So the muscles are firing to hold it back. And then you just follow through as you come through. And when you talk about throwers, you hear these crazy injuries every now and then. So every now and then you'll see case reports of a, of a kid who's had a shoulder dislocation from throwing a ball. And that's when these things have started to fail. Or you'll hear the, that the humerus cracks. So again, the, the amount of force generated from, from a throwing motion. So they talk about it being greater than 7,000 degrees per second as you throw a ball. And I'm not sure exactly what that means physically, but what it does mean is that it's a lot. And the amount of force is, is actually more than your body's theoretically able to handle. So your, your muscles are all firing to, to keep everything in, intact. Um, and when you start to get tired, oh, I feel better. So as you start to get tired, that's when you, you put yourself at more risk for injury. Same thing with the Tommy John injury. So the amount of force that your elbow sees when you're throwing is, is about maximal range of, of the ligament being able to take it. And all the muscles around the elbow help keep things in place. But if you keep throwing and throwing and throwing, eventually you get tired and you start to get chronic injury. So again, shoulder sees tremendous force during overhead athletics. What do we do with these athletes? You know, it, it's estimated that one in three high school pitchers will have uh, shoulder pain during the course of their career that needs to see a physician. Uh, they've done studies looking at, at professional athletes, and the number is about 28%. It's a little bit less in, in, uh, in non-pitchers. And again, why is this important? So there are 30 million children who play organized sports in the U.S., at least in 2009, and 6 million adolescents play, play organized baseball. Uh, it seems to be getting bigger and bigger and bigger. So right now we've got 7.3 million high school athletes playing baseball. Um, and then this is a heck of a lot of doctor's visits that come out of this. So again, today we talk about shoulder injuries. They're common. They're also seen in combination. So that's what makes all of this um, complicated and trying to figure out what's going on. So I'll go through a couple of the injuries now. We'll talk about what you, what you see and, and why you get it and then what you do. It's all pretty much, I don't want to say it's all pretty much the same, but it's, pr it's pretty similar. At the end of the day, surgery is the last thing you want to talk about. So rotator cuff tendonitis, like, like most of the things inside your shoulder, is caused by repetitive trauma. So you throw, you throw, you throw. The, the muscle starts to get tired. It starts to break down a little bit. We're all designed to do that. You know, when we walk, we have small little breaks in our bones, and, and our, we have little cells that crawl through there and fix those as you go, and it's the same thing as in any muscle. But if you, if you don't give enough time, um, it doesn't have a chance to heal. So again, you throw, you throw, you throw, the tissue starts to fatigue, you start to get inflammation in there, you start to get pain. At that time, once you start to have pain, you start to lose function in the muscle. So uh, a rotator cuff muscle that's, that's not firing well, they've done EMG studies on, on supraspinatus, and it, you, you lose about 23, 24% of strength after it's been injured. So. It, it stops working as well. If you can imagine, it's not holding that ball inside on the glenoid where it should be, and things start to kind of mechanically fall apart. So it's not, it's not able to uh, deal with all the forces that you see. You start to have degeneration, and then real damage. This is a, a video that uh, I stole from one of my mentors. You probably recognize this. Uh, so. One of, the, one of the entities that we talk about is internal impingement. So like I was saying, the, the little pinching that goes on inside the shoulder. Oh, no. Oh. That's sad. 
That was my favorite. That was my. That was my favorite video. <laughs> anyway, there, so this is a video that I, it's trying to to show what uh, what I'm talking about. So basically, what you see you see what's going here on the outside is is he takes this arm and he makes the arm do this. So he keeps doing this, and at the, at the same time he's got this camera inside the shoulder, and it's looking inside the shoulder. And what, basically, what it's looking at is it's looking at the. Uh, the, the top of your labrum, so it's basically the top of the inside of the shoulder, and then the, you can see the rotator cuff, you can see the biceps tendon, and you can see the, the ball as it's moving. And so as, as it moves, you can see the rotator cuff kind of come inside and get pinched between the glenoid and uh, um, the ball of the humerus. The question is, is this normal? Actually, on, w on one hand, yes, it probably is normal. So th this was a study that was done by Albrecht, I don't know, it was a long time ago. It's 16 years ago now. So he basically took 10 asymptomatic pictures. So these are pictures who've had no problems. Um, and they, they put them in that position on MRI to see what happened in, on the inside. They did it on both shoulders. And they, they saw that you have this impingement on the, throwing on the throwing side in all the pictures. So that's it's probably normal. And again, part of it comes back to the, the adaptations that your body makes. So I think at the end of the day, your body recognizes that when things start to pinch, that's when there's a problem. So as you start to throw earlier in life, your body makes changes so it avoids that initial pinching. Um, they've done other studies looking at pitchers who haven't uh, pitched or thrown a lot during their early years. And they actually have, they, they impinge at a, at a lesser um, degree of motion, so like a, a lesser external rotation, so, so like here as opposed to here. I'm exaggerating. Um, and they're at a little bit more risk of having labral injuries, for better or worse. And then the whole thing becomes, again, comes back to whether or not you have stretching or tightness. So in general, the anterior part of your shoulder tends to become lax. So as you start to do this, the ball starts to push out the front, and over time, it kind of stretches out the ligaments, so you have a little bit of laxity in the front. Again, at the beginning, that may not be a bad thing. It may be a normal thing. It may be give you a little bit more external rotation, but at some point in time, it may, it may cause too much laxity, and then you get a little bit of sloppiness in the shoulder and, and, and a problem. On the other hand, you've got tightness. So uh, one of the things that we talk about is GERD, which is, which is not GERD in your belly, but GERD in your shoulder. So GERD is, is uh, glenohumeral internal rotation deficit. So again, in throwing athletes, one of the things that happens is your bones change and you start to get external rotation as you start to lose internal rotation. So you're not able to turn in as much as, as you were initially. If, if the total arc of motion is the same, so if you're able to do this and this, and it's the same thing as like here and here, total, then that's not that big a deal. But as this capsule starts to tighten, which can happen if you're throwing too much or not stretching, you, uh, you put yourself theoretically at risk for injuries to your shoulder and then injuries to your elbow. So what happens is you, you wind up taking, um, you know, you're trying to generate as much force as you can. And if you're losing the internal rotation in your shoulder, it has to come out someplace else and usually where, where you get it is in the elbow. So again, throwing is an overuse phenomenon. If a pitcher's fatigued, they should come out. You shouldn't pitch, and you hear different things, but you probably shouldn't pitch eight or nine months in any 12-month period. We don't have that problem in Baltimore because the weather's cold, but I bet you have it here. Um, you should follow pitch count limits, and the biggest thing to following pitch count limits is uh, not pitching on different teams. So it's really, it's really easy to not follow the rules if you're on multiple teams because nobody's counting, um, except mom or dad. Uh, basically, you want to avoid radar guns. So you're not, you don't want to, you're not, a young kid shouldn't be pitching max effort all the time. They should be working more on their control and being able to be a more effective pitcher and not, especially, not necessarily a thrower. Again, conservative management for all these things, so you want to do activity modification, so you want to avoid overhead activity, NSAIDs, 
uh, increase sh shoulder range of motion, and then inject with caution depending on the age of the athlete. I, I, would put, I don't know if you can see this per se. This is a patient of mine. Um, so again, this is just to orient you, this is the humeral head here. This is the glenoid. This is the labrum. The labrum's mostly normal in this patient. A little bit of inflammation here. Uh, you know, there's a problem up here, so that's kind of the beginning of it. But I, this is a patient who had a, a significant amount of GERD, and I, I wound up doing what's called a capsular release here. So this is a, this behind this, what's a heat wand, basically, is the capsule. So that's basically the skin in the joint. And what you do is you basically cut, this, cut the capsule. This is a undersurface of the rotator cuff tear, so it's kind of wafting in as we're going. Um, and then that's the release. So as much as I'm a surgeon and I love operating, because I do, you, that's not the goal. Like I, I, I don't want to really see that that often. Like you want to avoid that. Um, okay, so rotator cuff tendonitis. This is a little different problem. So over time, again, you have little uh, wear inside the rotator cuff itself. Again, conservative management. So when I say rest for two to six weeks, that's basically stopping them from throwing that long. It does not have to be total rest. You know, you may want to take a couple days off, but um, at the same time, these people can be doing basically therapy. So you're doing exercises to, um, to stretch. You're doing exercises to strengthen your scapular stabilizers. You're doing exercises with the rotator cuff, um, but nothing that really causes real pain. You want to get the inflammation under control. You can do this with whatever modality that you want. Um, and then again, stretching and strengthening and gradual return to play. Um, there are basically two kinds of rotator cuff disease. There's compressive disease and tensile disease. Usually in throwers we talk about tensile disease because we, we talk about the, the energy that the shoulder sees as you're accelerating and following through. So as you're doing that, the rotator cuff's basically just saying stop, just trying to pull everything back. Um, so it's a tensile problem. A compressive problem, something where you, the thought is that the, the rotator cuff pinches on the up, upside of the bone or where the acromion is. It's, it happens in throwers, but it's less common. It's more in volleyball players or swimmers. This is you get a tear on the, on the um, bursal side or the above the inside of the joint. Um, and then there are a couple of anatomic variants that can cause that as well. Basically changes in the acromion. But again, that happens in throwing athletes too. Um, and then the idea of laxity and instability. So, you know, the simple things is if somebody dislocates their shoulder sliding into a base or whatever, you know, that's, a, that's something that's easy. It's clearly a problem. The problem is when you've got somebody who's been throwing for a long time and the question is, is are they unstable because their shoulder's too lax or is this a normal kind of laxity? So laxity actually allows passive translation in the humeral head and gives you more external rotation. And again, one of the things that, that allow you to throw the ball faster is, is greater external rotation. Instability is any unwanted laxity. So basically, this comes down to your physical exam and, and what's going on with the, the person that you're seeing. Uh, and again, you want to treat this conservatively. So <coughs> period of time of rest and no throwing. I mean, you can do pl pl plus or minus pitching analysis to, to see if they're what, what the player's doing, you know, if they're late, if they're leading with their elbow, if they're doing something that's wrong mechanically. Uh, rotator cuff strengthening, scapular strengthening, and then gradual return to sport. If you're not getting better, three, four, five months, you can consider surgery. Um, and that's basically to tighten things up. Labral tears, you know, I was talking to Leon a little bit about this yesterday. They're really common in, in, in throwers. It's not necessarily the kiss of death of somebody's career, um, although fixing them is almost a kiss of death. Uh, basically what happens is, if, uh, again, if, if I had that one video, it shows how the, the labrum gets pinched between the cuff and the ball, and this happens time and time and time again as you're throwing. Your body responds to this, and usually what happens is the superior aspect of, of your labrum grows, so it, it, it grows to help support this and you can get little splits and cracks in the inside of it. So getting an MRI in, on a collegiate pitcher who's having no problems, oftentimes you'll see a, big, a bigger area of the, of, the, uh, 
of the labrum there and you may or may not see a split in it and the split may or may not matter. Um, yeah, and then eventually if it tears it can start to peel off. So this is another patient of mine just to again to orient you. Here's the glenoid, here's your humeral head. This is me with a probe and then this is the, this is the labrum here and with this here I, I'm kind of hiding it but the, the labrum's peeling off here and you can see that better here. So this is labrum that's ripped off. This is the end of the labral tear here. And then again, so here's your glenoid. This is supposed to be here. Um, I change views here, so now I'm looking from the back. This is where the, the biceps is going off here. Again, here's the labrum kind of off. This is, I've, I've captured this with a stitch, and this is me putting in an anchor. And then it's tied down, and, and it's tight. One of the things you can also see well, when I was, I was talking about how the labrum is, starts to grow in response to all this repetitive stress is that if that happens long enough, you get what's called a Bennett's lesion or you actually have bony changes that happen. So this is where the glenoid is supposed to stop, but over time this, this labrum has you know, seen more stress, more stress, more stress. And so you're, the body is smart. You know, it, what it does is it, it grows a little bit of bone behind it to help support it. It's, a, it's the same thing that happens in arthritis. You know, when you're, cartilage starts to go, your body's smart. It starts to grow osteophytes and stuff to help relieve the pressure, and that's, that's what's happening here. Treatment, again, for this is conservative initially. You know, you don't want to shut the person down. These people are usually older, so they wind up usually getting an injection, going through a course of therapy, trying to, trying to get them better that way. And then if that works, great. And if it doesn't work, then you can go inside. You can basically burr this down. And then depending on who you're reading and whose side you're on nowadays, you can either do a biceps tenodesis or a slap repair. Um, biceps tendon. So I haven't talked too much about the biceps tendon, but it goes inside your shoulder too. Play, it plays a big role in, in stabilizing the uh, shoulder dynamically. Helps keep it a little bit from translating, but primarily from tr translating upwards. Um, or upwards, when I say upwards, kind of towards the acromion. Uh, it can cause pain for a lot of different reasons. It can cause pain with a slap tear because there's a slap tear. So the slap tear is with a, you know, it's basically the labrum rips off the glenoid. But the uh, biceps tendon also is attached to the labrum. So if it pulls every time on, on this injury, it, it will hurt somebody. Um, it'll cause pain if you have instability because it's working harder now to keep the shoulder where it should be. Like you can have pain with tendonitis because oftentimes the tendonitis is close to the sheath where this biceps tendon runs or tendinosis. And then the treatment, very, again, varies depending on the cause. There's been a lot of talk in professional baseball lately about whether or not you should do a tenodesis, I'm sorry, a tenodesis or a slap repair when you have these kinds of injuries. Um, and I think, uh, I, I think things seem to be a little bit more, we're, we're evolving towards maybe, maybe doing more biceps tenodesis, but right now it's probably um, not the best thing to do to start. I think, as John Uribe would say, he's like, God put things there for a reason. So if you start cutting things out, it may, may not really help you. So subacromial impingement, that's, uh, again, above the rotator cuff. That's kind of compressive disease. People will have pain with activity and, and throwing. You'll have pain with sleeping on that side. Your physical exam's a little bit different. You have pain with a Hawkins and a near. Again, you want to start conservatively, rest, NSAIDs, and therapy. Uh, I'm more likely to inject this. Um, and then if the people aren't getting better, you can consider arthroscopy. This is an example of this. This is a high school athlete that I had that just wasn't getting better. Um, if you probably see nothing here because you can't. So this is the tip of the probe. This is all bursa, so this is all just garbage. Um, this is after I've been sucking down the bursa for a while. So this thing's a shaver with the suction on it. It basically sucks the tissue in and cleans it out. So here's the bottom. This is the rotator cuff here. Oftentimes we talk about there being a spur. So there's a little piece of bone here. So people's anatomy is a little bit different. So some people have, you know, type one, type two, type three acromion. So the amount of slope there is on the acromion may or may not play a role in, in developing this kind of bursitis, probably does. So what you can do is you can use a, a shaver to shave this down so you have more space here so things aren't pinching anymore. And then it's nice and clean. So you go from 
So this is your rotator cuff here. This is your acromion, a whole bunch of space now. So you basically go from whoops, this to this. Um, so AC joint disorders, again, these are common. They're more common in, in older athletes. Um, again, here's your AC joint. Um, sprains, so that can be an acute injury. If you fall on that repeatedly, you know, you can actually uh, damage the disc that sits inside here and the ligaments that hold it together. Um, that's separating your shoulder. Uh, and then you can also have degenerative changes. So again, if all, all, I say this to most of my patients. So almost everybody comes in with an x-ray that shows some AC joint EJD. So you can see how everything here is flat. Most people, when you come in and you get an x-ray in my office, you're, even if you're in your 30s or 20s, you start to get a little bit of, of an osteophyte here and here and maybe on the bottom. Just because we don't live down here, we're, we're using our arms up here and you just do that over the course of everyday life. Um, and that's normal. And most people don't have pain. Most people don't have problems with that. Bless you. But if you, uh, you know, use, use your shoulder a lot, you can have a lot of pain in there. And this is just an example of, this is another high school athlete I had who, he actually was a wrestler in addition to be a baseball player. And he just had a ton of AC joint pain that was, didn't respond to injections or, or therapy or anything. So just to orient you again, so this is, this is, basically going to be your chromium going in and then clavicle. Um, and so again, I use that, that shaver burr to take down part of the clavicle here. And then because my hospital's cheap, I take the back of a rat tooth pickup, which measures 12 millimeters to make sure I've taken enough. So just to get on my soapbox again. So all of, I don't say all of these injuries, but all of these injuries are overuse injuries. So overuse is considered excessive and repeated, repeated use that, that causes injuries to the bones, muscles, and tendons. Children are at risk, especially because they have immature bones. One of the things I didn't talk about because I didn't know how much time we'd run into is you, you can get overuse injuries where if you repeatedly throw, you get what's called little league shoulder. And that's when the, uh, the physis starts to widen and it, it's functionally, you've broken your bone from throwing too much. So your bones are, you know, image, oops. you know, young bones have certain properties which make them strong, but the fact that they have a physis also makes them weak. Um, if you don't rest enough after an injury, you get overuse injuries. Poor training or conditioning leads to this. Specialization in one sport, and then year-round participation. And I, I mean, I, I do understand that it's a, it's a, a balance, you know, if you, um, you know, what does it take to be perfect or, or excellent at one thing? I, I think it's Malcolm Gladwell talks about genius and how, you know, to be excellent at something, whether it's being a surgeon or whether it's being a therapist or whether it's being a chess master or whatever. I think he quotes doing, tw I think it's 10,000 hours. So it's like 10,000 hours of, of repetitive anything makes you great at something or potentially makes you great at something. So I can understand you want to specialize in just one sport and you want to pitch year round. And if you want to be a great pitcher, that makes sense. But you just have, you have to understand that you're putting your kids at risk. So again, overuse injuries, you typically get deep aching inside the joint. It persists. Kids have problems lifting their arm overhead. Sometimes they talk about numbness or weakness. Uh, I wasn't sure who all was going to be here. I thought maybe there'd be a little bit more coaches, but I think you want to look at this from a, di a couple different perspectives. You know, an athlete's perspective is, you know, from a kid's perspective or a high school perspective, they have pain that keeps going on and they're not sure exactly what's going on because at the end of the day, this is a sport. It's supposed to be fun. Um, you know, it's, things are less fun when you're hurting. So they have pain that kind of continues. Their performance suffers because, you, you know, you have a hard time doing whatever it is that you're doing if, if you're hurting. And then their technique suffers and it kind of becomes fun, or not fun, and they start to lose it. From a parent's perspective, you start to see that your kid will complain a little bit more than normal. They don't necessarily want to go out there. Um, and this happens especially early in the season when you're doing exercises that maybe that you're not used to or you're doing two-a-day workouts. Um, and then from a coach's perspective, it's also similar to a parent's perspective when you start to see a little bit loss of motivation in the kid. Um, you see it a little bit more when they're doing more, more intense activity, and you'll notice changes in the kid's technique or form. 
So again, when you talk about the way that they pitch, they may be leading more with their elbow because they're, when you do that, you're keeping your, if you, if you keep the ball closer to your body or closer to your head, it allows you to create more torque with a little bit less effort. So that being said, that also probably leads to injury. So how do you diagnose all these things? Well, it can be done, it's basically what the person's saying. You get a physical exam by a sports medicine specialist and then radiographs. Um, and then exam. I mean, scapular dyskinesis can be easily identified by a therapist. I, you don't need a surgeon to do that. Um, and then the treatment, again, you know, it's, it's really, you want it to be non-op, non-op, non-op. So activity modification, so you avoid the things that cause pain. You avoid overhead stuff, so you, you try to keep them from doing pull downs and that kind of stuff. Presses can be a problem when they're causing pain. You work on stretching flexibility, core strength, um, and then appropriate return, and that includes a throwing program, program. So you don't go back out straight to pitch, you kind of gradually get back in there. So I just wanted to say thanks. Um, if you guys have any questions, I'm happy to answer.